so now we're going to continue with our focus on health care by exploring additional ways that we can offer value to our members through both online and mobile platforms, starting with our partners from Castlight Health and Anthem Blue Cross. Uh, we'll also hear about strategies to increase the use of these health information tools to drive consumer engagement. So Leanna, or uh, David, sorry, <laughs> will you please, oh, Leanna, you're going to start the introductions. Okay, great. Will you introduce our guests? Thank you. Thank you, Madam President and members of the board. Leanna Bailey Crimmins, CalPERS team member. CalPERS is a health leader and is willing to implement strategies to improve quality of care, increase access, and reduce cost. And as such, several years ago, CalPERS was one of the first large purchasers that implemented price transparency, and specifically a price shopping tool for our members because patients like to be engaged in their care. So, in August, the board received a presentation from Dr. Atif from Harvard, and he talked about price transparency in general. We know that people do not shop for health care like they shop for shoes, um, but we do want to increase transparency and be able to allow um, our members to go out and look at the lowest cost that's available to them for the same quality patient safety procedures. So he gave an overall general um, uh, overview and he also um, evalu evaluated specifically CalPERS compare tool to see if our members were getting the value that they thought that they were um, going to get originally from um, the implementation of the compare tool. So after the presentation, the board had directed the staff to bring back a presentation, a live demo, because it had been a while since you've seen Castlight. And so today we have a prestigious panel. We have David Cowling, who's going to bring us up to speed on where CalPERS stands when it comes to the price transparency and the results amongst our members. And then uh, beside him is Patrick Fett, who is from Castlight. He's going to talk to us about the original project scope and how we've actually implemented the compare tool on behalf of CalPERS. Um, he also will talk about how it's evolved over time and potentially some new features that's available to us as we go into 2018. And then he will do a live demo of the tool uh, for all of us to, to view. And then last but not least is Mr. Rob Honecker. Um, he is from Anthem and he's gonna talk to us about uh, consumer um, engagement and basically how um, items that they've implemented on behalf of CalPERS and their specific clientele. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to David. Thank you, Juliana. Um, I'm gonna talk about, um, kind of give a brief overview about how we got here today with price transparency. So in 2012, uh, CalPERS had 21 healthcare initiatives um, and included in those 21 initiatives was price transparency. In addition, there was a, a really a bigger movement around consumer engagement in healthcare, trying to get members engaged in their care. Um, a lot of this was to address pricing variation and we saw that success of our own with reference pricing on the hip and knee uh, replacement procedures. So with the success of that, um, CalPERS partnered with uh, Anthem and Castlight for Castlight Compare, uh, which was offered to our members in July of 2014 uh, to our PPO members. Um, and this was the website and smartphone application that Liana talked about. In addition, we set off on a multifaceted evaluation with Harvard University and Health Corps, which is a research arm of Anthem. Um, this included conducting over around 40 inter uh, interviews, uh, in-depth interviews with our members on through the telephone. It included a survey in internet and mail survey uh, of about 1,400 members in our PPO population to get their in, uh, opinions about this, the tool and about price shopping in general. In addition, and then lastly, Harvard University and Health Corps worked on claims data um, to look at the effectiveness of the tool. And so then in August, um, we came to the board and uh, Dr. Ativ Moetra from Harvard came and spoke about what these findings were for CalPERS. Um, in our surveys, we found that members believed that shopping for healthcare uh, on price and quality was important. They thought that these were things that they, they responded that these are things they wanted to do. Um, however, only about a quarter of our households used the tool in the first year. And only about 4% were what we called sustained and engaged users, which means they used the tool three times or more and with 90 days between the first and the last uh, usage. 
In addition, uh, Harvard reported that there was really no difference in the overall rate of growth in spending. And, so, and they compared this to a comparison population of Anthem uh, PPO members in California. In addition, Health Corps saw no difference in patients seeking reference pricing care as well. So it, um, we didn't really see any difference there. Although, um, to be fair, reference pricing had already been in place for a while when the, this tool was introduced. Um, although they didn't see any um, differences in prices for searchers who search for labs or uh, physician office visits, they did see a 20% lower cost for imaging services. And then lastly, 77% um, of our members reported being satisfied with the tool when they used it. And um, what we saw when we asked members and what we saw in the data that we saw, uh, the data that we got from Castlight, was that members were using the tool not necessarily for price shopping, but they were using it for other consumer engagement. They were looking at their benefit design, they were looking at deductible, they were looking at other member education within the tool itself. And so um, in August, Dr. Moitra um, had a slide on what he thought about price transparency in general. And so this is about his thoughts. He's done a lot of studies on price transparency. And the experience that CalPERS had was not unique. Um, so our experience of a small fraction of people signing up for the tool um, is what he sees in other studies as well. Um, he concluded that even though those who sign up, few use the tool before seeking care, and even when they do use the tool, for most services, searchers do not choose the lowest cost provider. So he had some thoughts on how to uh, deal with consumer engagement going forward. One is to look at different types of benefit design to increase the idea of price shopping, to engage our members in other ways. Um, he also thought that targeting key groups of members and assisting them with shopping could increase uh, price shopping in general. And then the last idea was an idea of his that he's kind of a pet topic of his is that given that we know there's little correlation between cost and quality of care, and we have lots of data that who the uh, low cost providers and systems are, that we need to design our um, and focus on trying to get our members to those low cost providers and low cost systems. And so at the end of his presentation in August, um, the board recommended that we bring Castlight in to conduct a demo and reintroduce uh, the board to the product. And so here today is Patrick from Castlight. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Thrilled to have an opportunity to present uh, to this audience. I joined Castlight about seven months before you went live. And you were an incredible story at the time that I was joining Castlight. In fact, I got a little bit of a preview of it before I joined the organization. And so it's been both interesting and challenging to watch this relationship uh, unfold over time, to see some of the learnings that uh, Dr. Ativ had shared with you in his body of research um, that David had shared with you as well. It's, it, it's been a bit of an um, aha moment in 2016, and then a follow-on aha moment in 2017 for us that I'll highlight for you in a few slides. Um, but I wanted to share with you the journey that we've been on, because you started in this process with us early, in the very earliest of days in this industry. Uh, there were a set of beliefs that if we gave consumers information about the healthcare choices that they have, they would tend to make shopping decisions that were logical just like they did in other areas of their spending in their daily habits. And let's face it, uh, as David so clearly pointed out, it didn't materialize that way. But here we stand as a company that was founded in 2008, several years later, having made a pretty significant pivot. And I wanna talk to you about what that pivot is and why the work that we've done together is so vital to where we sit today. Whether this board makes the decision to continue on this journey with, uh, with uh, Anthem and with Castlight or not, I think it's really important that you recognize the foundation that you've laid um, because I think it will be paramount to the su success of the strategies that you're about to take forward. So I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about what we're going to uh, see in a handful of slides. I promise not to go deep on these slides. And then we'll flip over into the user experience because it's come a significantly long way since we first partnered with the CalPERS organization. 
We're going to talk a little bit about the, the expectations, the learnings, and the opportunities both missed and made. We're going to talk a few minutes about what the evolution of the platform has been, because I think it's important to understand not only where we came from, but where we're headed. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the engagement patterns that we're seeing across the CalPERS membership today, and why we think that this has the potential to change over time. We'll step into the demo, and then we'll do uh, a few minutes of questions on the end, if that's okay. I know we're a broader audience, but I would certainly invite questions along the way. Don't feel as though, unless there's something prohibits it, um, <laughs> please don't feel as though you can't interrupt me. I'm happy to, to do sidebars, happy to field questions as they come up. Um, because this is fairly complex stuff, and if you haven't lived in the application, it can be challenging to get your head around it the very first time. As David set the stage, the going in expectations, I think, for this relationship were really around, as I said a few minutes ago, if we put the right information in front of people, they would do something fundamentally different in terms of the way they make their healthcare decisions. If they understood that price variation was three to five times different for the same commodity services, they would understand that they should naturally gravitate to the lower cost alternative. But the fact is, most of us have primary care relationships. We have even perhaps relationships with specialists that change those dynamics really di dramatically. We don't often tend to challenge the recommendations of an expert who's sitting in front of us. At least those people who, I, I'm 50 years old, I turned 50 this year, at least those people who are of my age and perhaps even a decade or a decade and a half beyond me, that's an uncomfortable position. But the two generations before me, or excuse me, that have followed me, have very different ideas about how to approach their healthcare. They are actively involved in asking questions, challenging decisions, seeking out the best quality care. They understand the cost value equation in a way that my generation and the generation that preceded me did not. This is hard learnings for us. And so the going in expectations, I think were a little bit unfair, a little bit unrealistic. This was an industry stepping into a set of uh, consumer ex ex engagement experiences that have never been mapped before. And we laid it up alongside of an Amazon or a Google-like experience and expected the same things to happen. I think what's important to understand is that we absolutely have the opportunity to influence with information how people seek out care. But it's not necessarily the savings coming from the work that we do to compare spot prices between a $600 or a $1,600 MRI. The greater opportunity or the greater influence is the ability to steer somebody to the appropriate level of care. See, when somebody makes their first choice, particularly if it evolves to a more complex or a more acute level of care, that initial going in choice is the greatest predictor of where the cost curve will remain. And what we've learned on the transparency side of things is that what's more important than showing somebody the entry point of cost on a transaction is helping them step through the journey of multiple decisions that happen over time. It's steering people through their care continuum, if you will. And so as we look for savings 2018, 2020, 25, 2025 and beyond, we know absolutely, and the data plays this out, that our greatest opportunity to influence the quality of care and the total cost of care is to steer people appropriately to the initial point of care. That's been the pivot that we've had to make in our business. Transparency is still rooted in the ability to compare prices, but also compare quality, interject uh, educational guidance, introduce virtual networks, as CalPERS is doing, introducing high value providers uh, that actually have boundaries placed alongside of them in the plan design. That's the opportunity to fundamentally swing the pendulum on cost. When we look at CalPERS data, we are just a handful of percentage points away from a break-even status when we compare you to our book of business. We support a 260 customer book of business, 65 of which are Fortune 500 businesses with multi, uh, hundreds of thousands of employees and billions in spend. They are challenged with the very same things that you are. However, their plan designs have tended to be a bit more consumer oriented. You're at a slight disadvantage in that your plan design does not line up extremely well against a consumer-driven strategy. But that said, 22% of our business is PPO business. 
and we only see two percentage points of savings difference between PPO and high deductible health plan participation in a more traditional setting. So I think there's hope here. We are not far off from being into the black on this. Um, we've created an experience. Members know that this is a utility play, and I'll show you what that looks like. So when Castlight hit the scene in 2014 with CalPERS, it was purely cost and quality insight. We were providing the greatest number of searchable services across multiple carriers. Anthem has, from day one, been our most sophisticated data partner of all the carrier relationships that we support, and we support every major medical carrier and PBM in the industry today. We supported approaching 20, cost, or excuse me, 20 different quality sources in the member experience. Castlight was an aggregator of information. We were not producing the recommendations ourselves. We were aggregating the information in 2014. As we started to fast forward through the user experience, we realized that we needed to drive additional opportunities for engagement. So we started to plug in pharmacy, then dental, then behavioral health. Then we started to plug in programs, like maternity programs, like uh, centers of excellence. Those gave us additional touch points for the member. We knew that the member wasn't going to come shopping unless we gave them a reason to be in the application. And so the width of the application had changed pretty dramatically. In 2017, we pivoted very fundamentally with an acquisition of a company called GIF. GIF was a leading technology company in the well-being space. So not care guidance, but in well-being. These are the healthy lifestyle habits that people embark upon that, if done long enough, if done frequently enough, have an opportunity to pull down the long-term cost of care. What Castlight saw in this opportunity in this acquisition was an opportunity that Anthem had actually brought to us. Anthem was in the process of looking across the marketplace and wanted to integrate fully healthcare guidance and healthy living, healthy uh, health, um, health and well-being initiatives as a knitted solution. We spent nine months uh, drafting what this model would look like before we stepped into the acquisition. We acquired GIF in January of 2017. We uh, announced the acquisition in January, completed the acquisition in April, and 1-1 one -one of 18 launched our first 24 Anthem Engage customers. Two technology platforms brought together in a white label experience under the Anthem label designed to engage members in a way they've never been engaged before. We have created, fundamentally, a communication backbone for every single program and resource that Anthem introduces to its customers and members. I'll share with you what that looks like, but when you piloted Castlight in 2014, it was very much a desktop-oriented experience with a mobile experience, a bit of an af as an afterthought. At that time, in 2014, it doesn't feel very long ago, but mobile use was low single digits. Today, in your mobile population, uh, 40, to 50, 40 to 49, 40% 40 of your users are on our mobile experience in just that very short period of time. We knew that mobile was going to be where we needed to be. When you look at the Castlight application today, it is still 1,400 plus uh, shoppable services. It is 21 nationally recognized standards of integrated quality indications. I'll show you what that looks like in a search experience. Uh, it is across the desktop, the mobile experience, and phone and chat. We've enabled every single channel of touch that you can expect in a consumer experience. We've added an ecosystem of partners. Today we support over 30 different partners that employers plug and play around maternity, around uh, con uh, chronic conditions, managing those who are at risk, high spend cohorts. We've created a targeted communications engine that no longer requires the member to come to us, but instead based on claims and based on their search patterns and based on their profile, we're doing automated outreach within the platform. Savings comes from the at-risk, high-spend 
portion of the population. That's the portion of the population that we've automated touch within the application. And lastly, this has become a one-stop shop. So when we do focus group studies, members repeatedly say to us, I'm most interested in the utility of the application. I'm not shopping for a price. I'm interested in the utility. I find healthcare confusing to navigate. I find my benefits confusing to navigate. I don't understand how my plan design functions. I don't understand when I have an out-of-pocket liability. This application has become an expert system or a, a personal assistant to steer people through that process. As I said, we launched uh, the first 24 Anthem Engage customers. We'll have probably close to 50 Anthem Engage customers by the end of 2018. They range from extremely large to middle market. What's changing in the Anthem Engage experience is that we have, for the very first time with a medical carrier, deeply integrated the programs that they are supporting. Their clinical programs, their virtual networks, their reference-based price pricing logic sits within this application. Members no longer have to try and sort this out or peel through pages of a book to understand when they're about to bump their heads on a complex aspect of a plan design. The application does it for them. The other thing that's incredibly powerful about the Anthem Engage experience is that the Anthem Health Guides, the live people who are available to help coach people through the decision-making process, are available through the application. It's fully integrated. When you introduce a new program around surgical second opinion, Wellvie, it becomes integrated as part of the member experience. Members don't need to recognize that you're adding and removing programs over time as the landscape changes. They want a single point of entry and a single place to make these decisions. That's what the Engage platform is designed to do. We're steering to custom networks within the Anthem offering. If you don't want a narrow choice entirely, but you'd like to have virtual networks that are created with high value providers that you've identified, you can do that. You can make that obvious to a member and still allow them the choice of the broader plan design. It's up to you. The platform's designed to support that logic. Accountable care, organ accountable care organizations, as you continue to refine what those look like, the application is designed to support that logic. Please. Dear God, do not ask your members to try and navigate these incredibly complex designs. This application is designed to take the mystery out of the equation for them. So let's look at what historically has happened in the application. Um, this is an incredibly challenging audience to engage, engage because of the disparate nature of its structure. When we typically would work with a self-insured, very large organization like an AT&T, as distributed as they are, they ultimately do have one corporate culture and one set of decision making, and it's fairly easy to, to follow that track from a communication and a marketing and engagement strategy standpoint. We have turned our organization on its head to figure out how to more uh, appropriately touch, attract, and communicate to members who are very much a body of this organization, but very much arms and legs at grace distance from the core of this. You know better than anybody. Unless we have the opportunity to fundamentally change and reach influencers at centers of influence, this engagement pattern tends to stay fairly flat. I'll share with you a couple of ideas that we have, but registration sits at 24%, return use sits at 49%. Compared to our book of business, 45% registration, 65% return use. Underneath our book of business averages, but I have to tell you, only four to six points, registration points away from being what we would anticipate to be a profitable relationship in terms of healthy ROI. So how do we get there? I'll talk about it in a second. But at this bottom chart where it says BOB email campaign, that's a book of business campaign that Castlight has sponsored. CalPERS happened to opt into this, and look at the spike that it produces in terms of net new registrations. When we're able to put the CalPERS audience or the CalPERS membership into our engagement engine, we do have the ability to change the trajectory of this, but we also have to work within the limitations that you have as an organization. When we look at the top searches, I apologize for how very small this is. Um, well, there's 
no savings, as, as uh, Dr. Ativ had pointed out. Primary care is the number one search. Psych psychological care is the number two search across the CalPERS membership. In our book of business, we typically see that between seventh or fifth. It's high across your population. This is a population that feels stress. I couldn't begin to speculate as to why. You probably know better than I. Um, but this data is telling to us. And when we look at how we've enabled uh, a targeted outreach program behind behavioral health, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. This is your only mechanism for reaching people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on a one-on-one -on -one level. Dermatology sits in the top 10. You may ask, big deal. But the fact is, this is one of the widest price variation services that people get on a frequent basis. Definitely an opportunity for savings there. Chiropractic care, to see it in top 10, is a very promising indicator. Because also in this top 10, you've got orthopedic surgery visits. So I know we've got um, reference pricing lined up against the, the surgical um, joint replacement. Really a positive thing to see chiropractic care in the top 10 searches. If I looked back 12 months ago before we implemented the targeted outreach, chiropractic care didn't sit in your top 10, just orthopedic surgery. It's an example of how we've started to surface recommendations that have cost savings tied to them. This is a determiner of health in terms of who we touch. So when we look at how we engage across the at-risk high spend cohorts, we look at people who fall into uh, claims related to depression, diabetes, low back pain, pregnancy, and routine users of care. Routine users of care, these are ER frequent flyers. These are people who tend to treat ER as their primary source of care. This chart represents dark blue as registration, lighter blue as return use, and the lines for each are your baseline registration and return use, and then each of the columns represents the level of overpenetration. This is an incredibly healthy tell. This, to us, says that within these segments, we've got an audience where we are reaching people who are high spend, at risk, and we are reaching them with one-on-one -on -one messaging around their specific condition or utilization of the healthcare system. To see 72% return use above a 49% norm is an extraordinary level of overpenetration. We would typically see six to eight, maybe 10 points, percentage points of overpenetration. It tells us we've got a lot of room for, of opportunity within the space. In Q4 of um, 2016, we introduced a set of predictive analytics and targeted outreach. It's a product that we call Action. And it consumes claims data, and it consumes search data. What are people searching for in the application? And then it makes intelligent recommendations to that member one-on-one -on -one through a push notification through the application or on their mobile phone, or through email, or perhaps we could even enable, this, we do this with other customers, outbound uh, calling. You've enabled 12 different programs or opportunities within action. And these programs, I'll highlight one just by example, uh, which is adult emergency room prevention or overutilization. It's the one in the purple box. Bear, bear in mind, we've got about 112,000 eligible members. Um, so this represents a small portion of the population, but it represents a large portion of the population who's at risk high spend, if that makes sense. Um, when we double click into this 6,814, what you see is that we're presenting content. Holy cow, this is an eye test for me. I wonder if that's an eye test for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we're, we're making specific content recommendations through the engine, through email. To the right of the screen, you're seeing what this email looks like. And in that orange box, this talks about the fact that life happens. And it's targeting people who don't have an urgent care facility added to their personal care team within the Castlight experience. So if they don't have that added, we presume they're headed to the ER. And in fact, there was a claim to prove it. So what we're trying to do is encourage them 
to proactively go in and add an urgent care facility to their experience. That this, that's what this email is suggesting. And across each of these 12 different opportunities, we have different communication journeys or pathways that we've designed for the member. If a member falls into multiple buckets, the algorithm decides which bucket is the first opportunity to improve the situation, to change the spend pattern, and then to move that person into their next nearest neighbor. Okay, so this only works if we change fundamentally the engagement picture. As I said, not by a lot, but we need four to six points of additional engagement on the registration side to get to a place where we would expect this to be in the black. Ground game communications, establishing a target 50 champion, base of champions, is without a doubt the thing that we've seen over the years produce the most results in the shortest amount of time. This is essentially developing on-site champions at locations that have concentrations of employees. So we, in early 2018, would like to work with the CalPERS team to identify what are those 50 locations that make the most sense for us to target. And then we'll go away and we'll do the work. I'll be stunned if we don't achieve the objective of the four to six points of registration that we're looking for. We've never done this in mass. We're committed to doing it in mass in 2018. In-app promotion, as I said, 40% of your 40 to 49 year olds are accessing the application through the mobile device. This gives us an opportunity to do in-app promotion that we historically haven't had opportunity to in the past. We'd also like to work with Anthem to test inserts and mailers through traditional tracks. We're doing this around the Anthem Engage experience. We are seeing it produce results when it's targeted. And then lastly, targeted email. So this four-pronged approach is what we're looking for to close the gaps. Okay, let me pause there for a second before we jump over to the demo. Any questions about what we've flown through fairly quickly? Can you just clarify for me? So I think you said we have 112,000 members yes. that are participating. 112,000 eligible households. Eligible households. Okay. Excuse me. And then in an earlier slide, there was a spike. You talked about a book of business campaign that we opted into. Yes. Was that these four boxes that you were talking about it or was. something different? Uh, it, well, okay. it, 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 it was um, in the in-app promotion which is one of the four boxes. Book of Business campaigns are now being promoted through personal recommendations and emails in the application as well. So it's, what happened in Q3 was not an in-app promotion, but it was a targeted email campaign. Okay. In 2018, we turned on a second track of communication, if you will through in-app promotion. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then I think I heard you say, so we're looking at a 4 to 6% increase in registrations. Our target, target would be minimally 4, 4 to 6 points, percentage okay. points. So we would target 30% household registration as the entry point to what we would predict as, as savings opportunity on, a, on an enterprise level. Thank you. Um, Teresa? Taylor? Yeah, thank you. Um, so who's the 112,000 members that are eligible? Sure, those are your uh, basic PPO plan participants. Okay, okay. Have so I that got that right, Rob? Is that about? Yes, yes, and just a bit of clarification. Uh, Cast Live, because of the focus on the household, the 112,000 is the household. So okay. if you so it's have larger a than spouse, that. that doubles it. Your actual membership-based relationship with this is about 200,000 because we take over people too old and too young because of security. But household, yes, 112,000 is exactly accurate, but it's a household. Okay, and so I don't know because I don't have a PPO, but um, currently they, they don't have to have a primary care physician that sort of is the gatekeeper, is that correct? They do not. Okay. Okay, so that's where I was getting a little confused because I was thinking of my own experience. I was like, I don't know that this applies. But um, you had said something about consumer-based plans. So I'm not quite clear on what you mean by that. So sorry for the jargon. Um, 
in our world, a consumer-based plan would be typically a health account tied to it. And like a health account, like a like a health savings account. Okay. Okay. And the member uh, has traditionally a greater initial share of cost burden on their shoulders before the co-insurance would kick in. Okay. So in that consumer-based plan, and they come in a couple of different flavors, but in that consumer-based plan, consumers tend to have some incentive because they've got personal financial exposure at a bigger level than what CalPERS has. Been. Higher deductibles. Higher right, deductibles. higher deductibles. Low, yeah, I got gotcha. you. So, and then you had said another term you used was healthcare guide, guidance, and I was just curious I forget where you used it now, but I was just curious as to what you meant by that. Sure. So when we w we think of two parts of our business, now that we've completed the acquisition on the well-being side, so well-being is sleeps, steps, nutrition, <coughs> healthy engagement. That's not what we're supporting for CalPERS today. What we're supporting for CalPERS today is traditional transparency, or what we would call care guidance. So the member is using the platform to identify who's the right provider, what's the estimated out-of-pocket cost, what care options do I have, how does my plan design support that. So that collection of decisions that we support we call care guidance. Gotcha. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. absolutely. My Mr. pleasure. Mr. Wilfonson? Okay. You could turn your microphone. Thank you, Madam President. Great presentation, lots to think about. So a, a lot of what you're talking about seems to anticipate the starting point of I as an enrollee are in a particular plan and now I'm navigating through that plan, as opposed to I the enrollee have multiple plan choices with all these complicated things that I don't understand until I enter into one of those plan choices. Can you comment on that transparency perspective? Yeah, it, uh, thanks for the question, I appreciate that. Um, and it's a question we've fielded frequently. Um, decision support historically, last five years, has been really one of two buckets. It's been helping the member make the appropriate plan choice at the front end of the enrollment process. Um, players who are dominant in that space tend to focus exclusively on uh, crafting a set of scenarios to help somebody model what their cost might be in a particular plan. It's not our business. We partner for that. On the other side of the equation, once I've selected the plan, within the boundaries of my plan, how do I effectively navigate the healthcare system as defined within that health plan? That's our primary business. Mm -hmm. um, we've made decisions a couple of times to leave plan selection to the sidelines. We'll see if it resurfaces again in 18. I know Anthem has had interest in that as well. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Mr. Costigan. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> so similar to Board Member Taylor, I'm in an HMO, so I'm not familiar with your program or plan, and I don't sit on the health committee. So how many lives, CalPERS lives, do you have? 26, uh, there's 112,000 households. Uh, the only two stats I have in front of me are households, but 112,000 households, uh, roughly 27,000 households who are registered within the 112,000 eligible. So households. the utilization rate among the eligibles is 24%. 20, 24%? 20%. 20%? It is. Okay. You did Right. So and actually the tool's not being used. One in five doesn't seem, seem to me to be an acceptable rate of utilization. Our book of business. I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking about CalPERS. So a one in five utilization among CalPERS members is, sounds, is correct, right? Uh, roughly. Okay. Well, so what 24%, is your outreach plan 24%. to get utilization up? And then I'm also interested in, you have 250 partners so uh, across that, is our, who's our data shared with? So you're collecting information about our members. Uh, sorry, could, uh, could I, uh, the question on the partners? Um, well, I just noticed on your website, you talk about you partnered with 250. I'm trying to get to where is our, is our member information shared with any of your other partner? Explain no. to me how it works. 
So the 250 are customers. Those are, those are customers. And so each of our customers have uh, data that has parameters around the data. So no customer's data is shared with another customer. Okay. Uh, so is that the first question? Is, is so, so around you're data sharing? Uh, uh, so I now I actually you've confused me a little bit more. You're taking data from ours to make to let the member have better choices, but you're not sharing that w across any of your other platforms. That's correct. We do not. Okay. Right. So we receive a claims historical claims file from Anthem, and that historical claims data is used to create the pricing experience. So when you, and I can show you what this looks like in the application, um, but that, that data is fully contained and secured and is not shared outside of Anthem. So back to the 20%, why do you believe the utilization rate is so low? The challenge that we've had in terms of driving additional registration has been the fact that there is not a centralized decision-making entity. You have independent organizations that roll up into the CalPERS umbrella. And so there's not an opportunity for us to broadly communicate because we're supporting the Anthem population within a particular municipality Employer. or whatever the entity may be, yeah. if See, that makes and sense. I, and I apologize for asking some of these basic questions because again, I, I'm not on the committee and, and I don't utilize the tool. Your contract is not with CalPERS? Or is your con who, who is your contract with? We are subcontracted through Anthem. Okay. Are you subcontracted with any of our other providers or just Anthem? Any of other plans? Any other plans? Any of the CalPERS plans? Uh, the, the other CalPERS plans. No, okay. exclusively Anthem at this time. A Anthem is our sole administrator okay. for the PPS. Okay, I'm just wanting to see. And that's 20 That's twenty percent of the 112,000 Anthem lives. 24%? 24% of the 112 Anthem lives, mm -hmm. which overall represents, I just want to make sure. 112,000 households. Households, About 200,000 lives. 200,000 lives out of 1.4 million. million lives in the mm -hmm. system. So I'm just trying to get some numbers here. So Anthem has more lives, but I think you've excluded the. Yeah, and maybe just to clarify some of those numbers, the transparency tool works most effectively in a PPO environment where a member's actually making their own personal choices about care. So this is being offered to your PPO members. You have active basic members, about 260,000. Um, Cast like carve some of those out because minors shouldn't have access to the system um, and a few varieties. So that brings it down to uh, around 220,000 members. So it's 220,000 um, uh, PPO members. Um, but because Castlight is a tool that is used um, for a family, um, you know the the 19 year old child using it isn't as important as his mom's direction. They focus on the household because that's where you want to get the registration. So the 114 um, is households um, and the 220,000 is the membership base of the PPO base, which is where this is focused. The basic PPO base. Does that help? It does. I'll have some questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank President. You. Uh, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm um, new uh, to the board, so I'm going to. Sorry, sorry, Rob, we didn't. Rob, can you turn your mic on? I think it might not be on. I may be off by 1%. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Brown. Okay, so I'm new to the board, so I'm trying to figure out what this is all about. Although I was uh, at a meeting where um, you talked about some of your earlier disappointing results. So. The goal of Castlight is to slow the overall rate of growth in spending. It's a cost containment Great. strategy. Great. So along the lines of Mr. Costigan, I think he rubbed off on me uh, this morning when, at the earlier session, uh, it looks like uh, 112,000 eligible households, and of course I started doing the math, 23% of that is about 25,000, 26,000, and then 4% sustained users, so that's about 1,000 
household and 77% of them are satisfied. So that's 793 households are satisfied. And I know this is probably way too simple, but you talked about a return on investment and I would like to know like what is the cost per household that we're spending so far on this tool that impacts such a small percentage of our members. I'm just wondering if we know what that is. I, I don't break the uh, cost down to that level. I'd have to provide that analysis after the fact. Sorry about that. So it's, um, you could. Um, the the all-encompassing program is about 62 cents per member, which is that 200,000 by number. That, that 200, that big, yeah, that's, that's the an Anthem PPO in multiple agencies, right? Yeah, it's and that's an all-inclusive number. There's no additional charges Castlight does for uh, their motivations, their demonstrations, their engagements, their outreach. It's an all-inclusive <coughs> number. So and just to clarify, uh, Ms. Brown, I think that part of the, the point of this presentation is that it has not penciled out so far, and there, it, I think one of the proposals is this engagement strategy on page 17 to improve the numbers to make it, to make it actually cost effective. And maybe you can help me with, like, <coughs> so when we talk about return on investment, is that CalPERS return on investment? Yes. I think and what, what does that look like? Mr. Cowling, so, Mr. Sorry, do we have a, is there a follow-on question or? Okay. So I think the, the, the question really was, is it penciling out right now? I think the answer is no, that right now it's not. Right. And it would require additional engagement up to this 30% of the population number in order to make it um, cost effective, to make the ROI pencil out. Yes, based on everything that we see across other customers, our estimate would be four to six percentage points required to get to a break-even status, the way we'd measure it today. Does that address your questions, Ms. Brown? Thank you. Are there any further <coughs> questions before we move on with the demo? Oh, sorry, Mr. Slayton, please. Thank you. So, since we're all engaged in basic math here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you said 62 cents all in cost, and that's, out of, and that's 120,000 some odd Households, is that? 100, 110,000. Well, whatever, yeah, yeah, some, yeah, somewhere in that range. So this is, this is a program that costs the system, if my math is correct, about $74,000 a year. Actually, considerably more. <laughs> 62 cents. At 62, yeah. The, so 62 oh, cents member. at, um, per member. it's per member per month? Right. So it's $7.30 per member per year? Oh, per if I'm year. doing my math. Gotcha. Okay. Something I like that. I forgot the little year problem. And right. then there's, Rob was telling us there's about 200,000 members. Okay. So that's one point, uh, what is that, 1.6, 1.7? So, 1. so, 7 so under $2 million a year is yep. what we're spending. This is in our PPO plans. Mm -hmm. Correct. So how do we possibly measure, how do you measure the return when this is individual decisions that uh, our members are making as a result of looking at your database, how do you know that they chose this knee provider versus this knee provider and that we actually save money? How, how are those metrics ever determined? That's a really, really important question, one that we've wrestled with for a very long time um, because you could measure the impact of a single transaction quite easily. As you start to see the data grow, the amount of noise that happens on either side of that line grows exponentially to the place where you cannot measure the impact eventually. Uh, we implemented a tool uh, just less than a year ago, a risk-adjusted uh, analytics platform that's used across universally, uh, almost universally across the healthcare um, provider space and across the payer space. Versend is the name of this tool. And what it does is it compares the risk factors of individuals across the CalPERS organization. It looks at those risk factors and then it looks at the spend relative to the risk factor and it estimates whether there was efficiency in that spending. 
this seems to be the industry's leading um, measuring stick, if you will. We spent four years building out analytics tools of our own to try and put a finer point on this. Uh, we tossed in the towel and spent a couple of million dollars on this tool uh, earlier in 2017 at the request of Anthem and some of our other uh, partners in this process. And it's still not perfect science. It's an extremely difficult measurement to make once you get beyond the individual level. But what we look for is that efficiency view at the top, and then we look for essentially evidence at the transactional level. Did somebody search 15 days, 30 days, 45 days ahead of a claim coming through? And could we associate those two things? And so do we have a bottoms up view that supports this macro risk adjusted view from the top? Does Mr. Cowling, I think Mr. Cowling wanted to also address how we've looked at it because we've also Yeah, so in Sorry, August, uh, Dr. Moitra talked about the analysis we did, and what we did was we looked at people who do searches for certain procedures and then looked at the average costs for those people who ended up getting those procedures done versus people who did not do searches or people who did not use mm -hmm. the tool at all. So it's more about averages. Not We're not looking at individual specific people making decisions, but uh, more about like what happened on average to people who did those searches. And we compared the popu our population in this pr program to other another book of business within Anthem that's not using Castlate. Is that that's right? That's correct. And the result was? We didn't find any differences no except for the no difference. for the one case of the imaging. In but the just, imaging. Just, but just looking at imaging. We looked at, for searches, we looked at three specific cases, which was office visits, where people search for office visits, for labs, um, and then also for imaging, right? So in the other two, we didn't see any differences. And then for imaging, we saw a 20% decrease for people who um, conducted a search for imaging. Okay, thank you. And thank I think, you. was that Ms. roughly $200 uh, average savings on imaging? It was something like that. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Bailey Crimmins, and then we'll come to Ms. Hollinger. Um, thank you. I just wanted to also point out that after Dr. Ateev's um, presentation to all of us. One of the things we needed to, to, to dialogue on is why did we hear about this after we had already established the rates? So we are bringing this to you. CalPERS is an innovator. It's great. Sometimes we believe price transparency is a good thing, a shopping tool. Sometimes the experience doesn't uh, pan, pan itself out. But today is not necessarily um, to, to make the decision right at this moment. But between now and June, when we established a 2019 rates, we will have to decide if this is something that we will be um, moving forward with. So this is more of just understanding it hasn't panned out. Um, that's, I think that's, there hasn't been the ROI. The question is between now and June, based on what we're hearing from Castlight and Anthem, are there things that we could be doing to engage our members? Um, we've heard from our members that they'd like to see more incentives given to them to actually reduce cost. Um, so are there things that we could be doing based on the value-based insurance design that, uh, design that Dr. Donaldson has um, laid out? So we will be bringing that to you, and that will be a decision um, either just to decide to move forward with Castlight into 2019 or not. So I just wanted to kind of level set why it, it feels like, you know, we're wrestling, acknowledging it, it just didn't pan out, um, but I still think it was a good idea, and that was where the industry was. Question is, are we going to make changes, um, or do we go ahead and remove it from our benefit design? Right. Thank you. Ms. Hollinger. Yeah, I had a question if other information is communicated through the mobile device. In other words, can you schedule your appointment on it? Can you get your results so that it would create a level of like even lab results because then I would have it on my phone to show another doctor to even corroborate a second opinion or um, or is it merely a price shopping? Yeah, th th thanks for the question. That's a really important distinction because you've just described the pivot that's happened in our industry. Industry-wide, no one would debate the fact that shopping for the price on an MRI isn't enough to produce significant enough right. savings. What's happened is that the member has raised their hand and said, I'm on overload. I can't navigate all that you've given me to navigate. Help me simplify my decision-making process. And so in the new Anthem Engage experience, and I'll show you a couple of highlights of this, but 
you can make an appointment for Quest Diagnostics with Quest Diagnostics to schedule your biometric screening. You can have those results populate back into the application so that you could share them with a provider. I'm also curious, um, don't take this the wrong way, but how the how it comes up. Like let's say I wanted to go out to dinner and it's open table and I wanted Italian, I could see. Sure. I, it, does it come up? These are the four people, the four providers in your area for an MRI and it, does it list the price? May I show you? Because sure. it's, it, it's pretty intuitive actually how it makes those recommendations. Got so it. next up is a demo, but before oh, we move okay. to the demo, it, it, yeah. we'll, we'll see if there are any I, other questions. The reason I asked yeah. the questions regarding engagement and being able to make appointments is um, I was trying to gauge whether I even saw that this 6% increase that for it to have utility or pay for itself sure. is I even thought it was in the orbit of probability. <laughs> It's, again, you've hit the nail on the head. This is fundamentally why the, the platform has pivoted the way that it has. If this doesn't become a communication backbone and an enabler for the broader strategy, it doesn't have value. Right. Um, and I'll caveat that by saying members who are in a high deductible health plan have between 15 and 25% personal savings opportunity, whether that ever translates to savings for the business or not but that plan design doesn't exist for CalPERS today. Right. But there is member saving opportunity. When we go into a market, Indiana by example, had 11 very large employers, State of Indiana and IU Health, all adopt transparency. Cost of commodity services came down by 17% across the market when the disparity in price became known. So market savings does happen, even if at the individual employer level, it doesn't happen immediately. But 83% of our book of business is enjoying positive savings, 1.25 to 1.75 times ROI. So it does work in the right circumstances as well. Sure. Okay. okay. Well, uh, seeing no um, further questions at this time, I th let's move on to the demo. And Terrific. Then I'm sure we'll have, that'll spark more questions. Okay, Thanks. fantastic. If you guys don't mind, I may stand um, so I can point a few things to you. And my friend and colleague, Wes Roon, over here on the side in the pink tie is driving for us. So I'll present from here if that's okay. Camera crew, you're good here? Okay, fantastic. So we're logging in, and I'm, am I standing in your view? Okay, terrific. Um, we're logging into the current CalPERS experience. As a member uh, on the Anthem PPO plan, this is the experience. And you can see uh, this looks substantially similar to what you'd expect in a pretty traditional uh, Google or Amazon-like experience. So I have personalized this for, based on my eligibility file, I know where this person is logging in from. I've got, because somebody's coming into this, haven't been in recently or maybe hasn't been in at all into the application. This header would step them through uh, five or six different steps to help them understand what the experience is. How do I shop for care? How do I navigate my benefits? I've got top level navigation here, healthcare claims, my health plan details, the benefit programs that I'm eligible for, and my personal profile. I'm introducing the opportunity to receive a text to get the mobile download because this is someone who, again, hasn't been in the application recently. I can tell because of that header. And then I'm introducing in the home page telemedicine 24-hour nurse line prescription plan. So this is using my healthcare claims data to make suggestions for what sits in the home screen. So this is personalized to me. If David and Rob and I each logged in, we would have a different constitution of the home page depending on our profile, depending on uh, the things that we might be eligible for. Wes, if you'll scroll down a little bit. This is a quick snapshot of my personal care team. So these are my go-to physicians. Um, in my profile, you'll see in a little bit, um, my wife's gynecologist is in here, my primary care doc is in here, uh, my son's pediatrician would be in here. These are pre-loaded or these are loaded by the member. When I'm on my mobile experience, this is a super handy way for me to be able to quickly navigate care. 
I've got additional suggestions of resources available to me. I've got access to online help. And then if you scroll just a little bit lower, Wes. These are what we, what we call opportunity cards. These are um, specific learning opportunities for me within the application. So again, based on things that perhaps I've searched for, based on my healthcare claims, we're introducing content into the experience. So if we'll go back to the top, and I'm gonna pull a couple of notes here just so I don't drive Wes crazy by going out of order. Let's go back up into my profile. In my profile, I have immediate access to a virtual insurance card, my personal care team, the account settings and my communication preferences are, are all set here. If I don't choose to have email, if I don't choose to have mo mobile push notifications, I can make those choices within the application. Um, and let's go into care team for a second. So one of the unique features within the care team is that I have the ability to introduce notes. So if I've had a recent appointment, if I've got specific instructions, my wife does this for me. On rare occasion do I take Ben to the pediatrician, but occasionally when I need to, her instructions for me actually sit right in here. When members give us feedback on the application, the progression is moved from shopping to utility. The members view this as an opportunity to streamline their benefits and healthcare experience, to make this simple, to make this more intuitive. So we've continued to build utility into the application, as members have asked for it. Um, let's go into the benefits tab just for a second. Within the benefits tab, I have my health plan, I have my pharmacy benefit manager. These happen to be specific programs given to me through my Anthem relationship. So 24-hour nurse line, Live Health Online is my telemedicine provider. I hate to tell you this, I used one last night. I have a terrible infection in a tooth. <laughs> I thought I was gonna end up in the ER last night. I used Live Health Online, it was amazing. Drove down to Green Bray to fill a prescription at 3 a.m. Um, I look pretty good, right? WellV, your new decision support, is featured within the benefits tab. And you're gonna see how these programs play out in the search experience too. One of the biggest problems that carriers and, and sponsors, health plan sponsors have, is communicating effectively what programs are available at the appropriate time of need. If I were to click into Live Health Online, Wes, you don't have to go there, but it is a direct single sign-on integration into the Live Health Online experience. This is extremely intuitive and easy. I literally was sitting in a Marriott courtyard in my bed, single signed on into Live Health. In 12 minutes, they actually run the clock, in 12 minutes I had my prescription ready to go. That's healthcare utility. Uh, by the way, the pills are the size of a, my, my pinky. They're like horse pills. Um, Wes, let's go over to the plan details page. So one of the great mysteries for most of us is how do our health plans actually work? Um, you have some pretty unique features in the health plan that uh, Anthem is supporting here. One of which is, oops, excuse me. One of which is your value-based uh, benefits, which we'll go into in more detail. If you'll scroll down just for a second, Wes, you can see I have my spending to date. I have an explanation of each of the different aspects of my coverage detailed here. If Wes, you'll click on coinsurance, you can see how this works. And then if I scroll down, I have a representation of all of my preventative care services. And anything that's blue is a hyperlink. I can search directly from my plan design out to a colonoscopy if that's where I was searching for an MRI or whatever it may be. We'll go down into medical services and I'll actually show you how this works. Um, let's see if we can spot an MRI in here, Wes. There we go. So, Wes, sorry about that. I keep bumping the wrong button here. You can see no coverage 10% and 40%. Prior authorization is required. So I'm educating people about the limitations on that particular aspect of coverage. Wes, can you uh, navigate to the MRI? There you go. And let's do low back. 
So this is pretty simple. I could actually hover over the different parts of the body and perform the same search. But when I do this search, one of the things that you're going to see is, scroll up just for a second, Wes. This is my out-of-pocket exposure, subject to my plan design and my spending to date. I've got search criteria here. So we default the search to be least expensive, or as you'll see in a minute, high value providers at the top of the list. But not every member values that most. And so there's certainly the ability to change that profile. If I were to click into this particular radiologist uh, for Valley, Wes, can you do that really quick? Or NorCal, sorry. One of the things you'll see is that there's image, uh, MRI image quality data in this particular provider, but not for this one. So the member tends to gravitate to where there are additional data points available. If I go into this particular imaging center and click on quality and scroll down, you'll see that there are multiple locations for this imaging center. And then you also have quality references provided by AIM Specialty Health, an Anthem subsidiary. Let's go to, let's do a search quick, if you don't mind, Wes. Can you um, type in knee replacement or knee? So as Wes is starting to type, like Google, it's providing him some guidance as to the most popular searches and things that are related to the condition or the procedures that he's searching for. In this case, he's searching for knee replacement surgery. And this is live data within the CalPERS experience. So I've got a demo login that we're using, but this is actually the, the live experience. I think, um, as you were asking me, sorry, Hollinger, thank you so much. <laughs> trying to read it. Uh, you were asking about what does the search utility look like? If you'll scroll just ever so slightly, um, you'll see that we've embedded in this search result, this is the intersection of cost, quality, education, and guidance in a single search experience. So four years ago, we searched, you'd see a price. Today, you see a very different representation of information that ranges from what are the types of things that I should be considering? We've got educational guidance in here. These are the things that I should know before I go. Oh, by the way, did you realize that there's a Welby surgic Surgical Decision Support service that's offered as part of your benefits program? Great, I could click through and see it here. Do you know what you're covered for? If not, let me introduce it to you here. And then we drop down into the search results. And we used to render the search results based on, Wes, can you scroll down, please? We used to render the search results based on price, but we found that when we present price, people are suspect is their employer forcing them to go somewhere they don't want to be. So now when we render the search results, it's quality orientation. And then, given the opportunity to see all the results, and we'll see what the financial impact of this is. Now there are a couple of results here. I want to point something out. So when we search for MRI, I don't know if you remember, but the filters were quite different. So anywhere I land in the application, the application's smart enough to help me know what are the different factors that play into my decision. This value-based purchasing program that you've implemented, and I think, Rob, are we expanding this to 12 now? 12 uh, reference pricing, 12 new pr procedures. Mm, right, for ambulatory surgery. So Wes, if you'll scroll so we see both of these. Let me show you something that's unique to California, in particular Northern California. So we have two surgical centers that are both a part of the value-based program, both high quality, both with great prices, uh, excuse me, but great patient ratings. But notice this. This provider, John Muir, I can show the cost of the procedure. This provider, and you'll see in just a second, this provider you cannot. This is an anti-transparency provider. There's an agreement that prevents us, well, we have this price, there's an agreement between the provider and Anthem that prevents us from displaying anything other than the out-of-pocket liability. Nobody in the industry does this. If there's an anti-transparency provider gag order in place, anybody else's search results shows nothing. We show the out-of-pocket liability. The member is legally entitled to know what their out-of-pocket expense is, even though we're bound from uh, presenting the rest of the price. 
Uh, Wes, could you just click on that little information button for a second? Anytime I've got search results related to price, I've got the opportunity to understand what's included in the procedure, what's not. Uh, there's additional drill down, de drill down detail. Here happens to be the explanation of value-based purchasing. I'm guessing most members intuitively don't understand what this is. So if we give them the opportunity to click through in the context of their search, Wes, can you pop that just for a second? You'll see an overview of this particular aspect of the program. This application started by providing a price. It's turned into a utility application. This is a communication backbone for all of the plan design that our customers implement. OK, let's do, um, how are we doing on time? Can, can we go can just I a just couple minutes? Can I just ask you minutes? before we yeah. uh, move on, Patrick? OK. Uh, we have a question from one of the Sorry, board members, Mr. Costigan. The last slide, I just want to make sure I understand this. Uh, sure, it's not a s or the, the slide or in, or in the demo the here? In the demo. Okay. The last demo. Go back the to last screen. The, last the knee replacement surgery mm -hmm. screen. Knee replacement. I, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. We'll just pick John Muir, and I'm not picking on him. Estimated price is 70200 for the knee surgery. CalPERS is writing a check to John Muir for $64,850? Writing a check to Anthem. Well, okay. But yeah. We're, we're writing a check to Anthem for $64,000 for that member? For that particular procedure. Well, a little bit more details, but to answer that simply, as a self-funded account, yes, you are writing the check to John Muir. Uh, we're just administering it. Um, but I think what you're also looking at here is those are their average prices. You have a special deal through the knee hip um, that actually limits the price of John Muir. That's why they're one of your designated facilities. So you're probably going to play closer to um, 30000 in your okay, membership. And that's what I'm trying to get at is your where's that number coming from, that 64000 If this is live, where does that 64850 come from? This of the seventy, but that's not what we're paying. It says CalPERS pays. I know. 64850 So the question is, is this an accurate reflection? And if not, why well, you said not? This, was a live, this is a live screen. Yeah. Okay. What's the accurate reflection is what the member pays. Because if you take $30,000, 20% of that on the member's benefit plan is about $6,000. they will fit their out-of-pocket because of other things. So the 64000 is from an aggregate data of not just what CalPERS pays, but what the allowable amount is typically. John Muir has a special behind the scenes deal for knee hip. And maybe we can work with Castlight to articulate this better. But the point um, they're trying to make is that um, the average cost at these facilities are very high, but your responsibility is low because of the special well, CalPERS. I'm sorry, Rob, there are two so, responsibilities here. As a trustee, yeah. I'm not the member. I'm more interested in line, the second line, which yeah, is what the paying, system pays. You have uniquely special deals so, with so five facilities in the state. So that number is not accurate. Okay. Is that correct? I'm just wanting to make sure. That's a question. Is that number, is that, is that what we pay? And if not, why is the, the correct number not reflected? I, I think we might get too far into the weeds here. It's but It's not um, a weed question, Rob. If this okay. is a, as a trustee, I want to know. Is that number accurate or not? You have a deal for knee hips at 30,000. Okay. For routine knee hips. The benefit plan allows for higher payments for complex. So what they're doing is saying what CalPERS has paid up to. If you had a complex knee replacement where Plus they needed five to six days, it could have been 64000 So we can maybe work with Castlight to better articulate this, but in your environment, the last time I looked at John Muir, you had about a dozen last year. Um, and I'll get these numbers wrong, but eight were at the 30,000, four were at the complex, come back in, infection. We don't limit doctors on that. And then just but one yeah. last question, Madam President. Yep. That 5350 is based upon the 64850. It is. Yep. Which, if a member is looking at, it's not you pay, you may pay, 
at the high rate. If it's actually 30,000, it reduces that amount because it would be 20% of 30, which is the members not getting the most up-to-date information. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you do, and also these are unique ones in that you have only five facilities that came back and renegotiated it that said, I want to be in CalPERS, that's such a significant brand. Unfortunately, John Muir and Stanford are ones of those. Normally, you'll just see a non these are unique to CalPERS. So. Um, sorry, sorry, we have a question over here with Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, else. Madam President. The it's home and patient. Go ahead, Mr. Chief. Rob. Okay. Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Uh, back to the. Actually, um, Dr. Cowling just made a really good point. Maybe you bundle your payments. This is also professional, yeah, correct? Yeah. It is. That's for yeah. the entire episode of care. So we'll show you what's in here. If you'll. Yeah, put this so that's left. another point. John Muir, you're not just talking for inpatient for the hospital for routine. You're paying thirty thousand, but there's also orthopedic, MRI, right. et cetera. Here are all the things that are included in this episode of care. Okay. Okay. So th yeah. that was going to be my question. What is the explanation for that? And so this is the explanation for what that costs. What's it driving is. that cost? Right. It is. And yes. that's provided to each member every time they search and and look at the various needs they have, this explanation is provided behind those numbers. It is. Right. One of the great impossibilities for a member, if I were um, to have a second child, my wife and I were to try and estimate the cost of a pregnancy, we have no idea what line items go into that episode of care. So Castlight looks at claims across the Anthem database, assembles the, episode, the most common episode of care, and represents that total episode of care here. So, so how and does the price. member, you said that the, depending on the type of knee surgery, so how does the member then get uh, access to information to find exactly what they need and then get the information that's driving that cost? So are you wondering, would the member, how would the member get to line item yeah, costs? Be, yeah, right, because they, it varies, you know, depending on the type of knee replacement surgery you're going to have. It, it does. In this price estimation experience, there is no opportunity for the member mm -hmm. to get to line item breakdown okay. Makes sense. and then try to estimate individual line items within. My okay. wife happens to be maniacal about this, so she'll actually go search for each individual line item. But she would have, so when we had our child, she was really anxious to understand was she going to get enough imaging? Were they going to clip the number of images she could have? So she actually went through and did the process of searching online items. But Castlight doesn't assemble a line item quote, if I'm understanding the, yeah. the, the question correctly. I think the other piece of this is whether you're having a basic, simple um, knee surgery or a complex one. That might not be something you would know until the surgery is underway. Is that right? Or is that right. something you know in advance? But um, if we did, yeah. Wes, could you do just one quick search for earache, something really benign? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, Mr. Slayton. Same experience, but rendering really different information here. If I were to look at the recommendations for this condition, which oftentimes ends up with a mom taking a child into the emergency room, there would be specific guidance. I won't waste the time of, of, of this audience to go deep into that, but if you'll scroll down, Wes. You can see, oh, scroll up just for a second here. You can see, again, the things that you should know are relative to the search that I've just performed. If I were to search for pregnancy and double click into the recommendations around pregnancy, I'd see recommendations for each of the three trimesters. I would see recommendations for imaging. I would see recommendations for um, uh, vaginal birth versus cesarean section and the harm that comes when scheduling cesarean sections. The information that we're compiling into a single search is designed to make the user an informed user, not an expert in their condition. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, what we're we trying to do is steer the dialogue, make people acutely aware of the fact that they have different care choices, 
Uh, they don't have to head to a specialist for absolutely everything. Yeah. If I search Remicade, Wes, can you I, I think part of what you're oh, hearing is okay. um, a concern about the accuracy of the information that's, that members might be using to drive their decision making and whether the previous slide on the knee replacement surgery really reflects the true information that a member should be using to make that decision. It's based on the claims based on the average claims. The actual claims themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not an estimate based yeah. on market averages. It is okay. actually based on claims data. Okay. Yeah, and I and just to clarify, and I think I was um, answering the question wrong because I was talking about the network contract. It's really important to realize that they're bundling the whole payment so that a member understands all of their costs, the surgeons, the nurses. That, I was more concerned about the hospital cost being reflected because you did go out and get a special deal. Right. So I apologize for that. So the $64,000 or the $70,000 number included $30,000 for the surgery itself plus $40,000 of other things including uh, imaging, physician visits, hospital stay? Pass, follow up PT, it's all oh. inclusive. So okay. you're going to see your orthopedic surgeon, he or she's going Actually, to give pay. Okay, with I'm sorry. Okay. All of care as far as the follow they usually include orthopedic surgeon follows up. So I said PT, okay. but yeah, it'll it'll be an all inclusive. And I was answering more of a contract negotiation right. relationship because you did a special deal with John Muir, which we were excited about because yeah. they cut their price forty percent for you. Okay. We do have a few additional questions that have been spurred by this. Um, Mr. Slayton. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. So I I, I just my concern is transparency, and, and one of the challenges in this whole field is the issue of, of transparency. Do I, as a prospective patient or as a patient, actually see what everybody's paying? So my question is, what we see is the maximum. We don't see the minimum, and I'm sure the data shows minimums as well as maximums for that knee procedure, for example because you have the data. So first question is, why don't we see the minimums as well as the maximums? Uh, that you can't have this knee procedure done at that facility for, for less than X dollars. Absolutely. And then the other question is, once the procedure is done, do I as the member see exactly what CalPERS paid and exactly what I'm paying? You do, mm -hmm. yes, uh, two really important questions as it relates to transparency is and sorry was that directed to me or to it's my colleague group. Rob? <laughs> okay um, so let me start with the easy one the claims um, can you log well can you log in to engage and just pull claims really quickly so while I'm answering this uh, the full EOB statement is housed within the application so when that claim is adjudicated fully settled, that representation is back within the application. So the member can certainly see on a line item basis. This happens to show spending for 2017. This is my family's demo data. Um, if you'll go down to a claim and click uh, the tip for uh, November 27th, you can see here's an inline tip within the benefit statement. And you'll see it'll build. Scroll down, there's the line item breakthrough, breakdown. Paid by Castlight. Because this particular demo account is set up uh, differently, different plan design, you're not seeing the strike through pricing and discounts mm -hmm. that would represent here <coughs> if that were the case. But this is how it gets represented. And then, Wes, if you go, scroll down once more, cost breakdown. And then that would be the additional detail behind it. So in terms of transparency post-procedure, it's fully there. In terms of the estimates on the front end, those are claims where we have enough density to arrive at an estimate based on the total bundle of care or episode of care. And so in some cases, they're wide ranging. In other cases, they're very narrow. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the r range of results from top to bottom. It's just that the filters weren't set to show that entire range. 
So you could search for lowest cost, highest cost, lowest quality, highest quality, 100 miles from home, 10 miles from home, programs that are center of excellence, uh, programs that have other, you know, I think the question was the range of cost at an individual provider or facility. Right. It could, co could cost as little as this at this facility or as much as Yeah, this so what, when I'm looking at it and trying to plan what I'm going to do as a member, what do I see when I'm at the planning stage? And do I see the bottom of the range as well as the top of the range? Yes, we present ranges. And yes, we present pre precise pricing. So in the absence of enough claims density, we'll provide a range, range. Okay. top to bottom. If there's enough claims density, we'll provide something that could be as exacting as within $10 of what the final benefit statement shows. OK. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Mr. Gillihan and then Mr. Jim. Thank you, Madam President. I just had a question, and I know we, we got hung up on the, the hip replacement or whatever that was. But the, the, the uh, members out of pocket, I thought if you're using in-network providers that there was a cap on the annual out of pocket for the members. That's mm -hmm. true. And yep. and it's higher than five thousand dollars. I know. I just it seemed like. Uh, this is yeah, not a high deductible plan. plan. So we switched applications, but it, it it describes the plan design within the plan details. I don't have it off the top of my memory, but. So I guess what he's asking is the, the member share. Is it capped at what our max annual out of pocket is? It is. Okay. And, and so when they're searching, they they would see that if they've already hit their annual cap, that they would have no out of pocket. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah. Thank there you, Madam uh, President. Yeah. So what happens if it's a Medicare recipient? Where's the data? Different population that's not currently using this application. This is actives. Just active alone. Active. Well, actives or, or early retirees might be included, right? Basic plan only. Yeah, this is just for basic plan members. So what are you doing for retirees? Um, actually, since um, we're on a supplement to Medicare plan, what we do is pay supplementally to Medicare. Um, so all the pricing information you see can be gotten from CMS.gov. So they'll tell you about the prices and about what they will be paying. We supplement that fully and cover it. So if it's a covered service, you're going to get full coverage through um, Anthem. But we can't set prices for Medicare or project them. So what we do is direct you to CMS. Um, they're not as advanced as Castlight, um, but they have been doing some very, very good things on their CMS.gov site. And so, so in your long-term planning or do you have any uh, part of your goals to deal with the uh, product for the retirees I'm so they don't have to, so they don't have to use two different systems our problem is no matter what we do CMS dictates it so I can't really um, take over their system and incorporate it um, it'll be a CMS decision so um, it is not even being looked at. It's an interesting question. We can go back and talk to some people about it. Um, but in a uh, supplemental benefit design, you are restricted to the reality that whatever CMS pays, you simply supplement. So CMS has to be the driver of that. So I have two more board members have questions, and we're actually now running behind time. So uh, I'm going to close the questions, and then we're going to move on. Mr. Honecker still has a presentation as well. So um, first, Ms. Brown, and then Mr. Lynn. Thank you. Um, if we are able Is your microphone on? Oh, sorry. If we are, thank you. If we are able to get 4 to 6 percent more participation to get up to 30 percent of households, uh, why do you think our overall rate of growth will decline? The overall rate of growth. I'm not sure I'm following the question. It, isn't that investment. the original goal, that the overall rate of growth, wasn't that the original goal to, yeah. the overall rate of growth in spending, right? That was the measure, and it didn't decline with the 23% of households. So, so now you're saying if we get 4 to 6% more, or 30%, then we will break even on our return on investment. So what I'm trying to find out is why does 
why do you think getting four to six percent more will make the overall rate of growth growth decline? So there seems to be a point on the curve at which there's enough density in the registration relative to the spend that we now have an opportunity to influence the decisions at a level that creates potential for savings. So the population is just simply too small until we've reached critical mass. So we're, it's, it's significantly, in, it's too small right now. We need to be bigger. To it's too small, right? Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lind. How do you, Lind over here, <laughs> how do you integrate or try to integrate this platform with the member's relationship with his or her primary care physician? Because, you know, for instance, I know I've had the same primary care guy for 35 years, right? So if I need a specialist, I go to him and he refers me to someone. And all, all, the only filter I know he uses is the person's going to be in my network. But beyond that, it may be, you know, his golfing buddy or somebody he knows. They all tend to be in the same area and, and sure. all of that. So how do you get primary care physicians to utilize this to, to try to drive patients to high-quality, low-cost providers? Uh, so, so thanks for the question. I appreciate the challenge in that because it was the going in challenge five years ago. Um, if we couldn't get the primary care physician to change the way that they were guiding people, we couldn't fundamentally change the cost curve at all. Um, and what we're finding is that primary care physicians are more tuned in to the cost and the recommendation that they're making today than they were five years ago. So partly it's an awareness factor within the primary care arena. Um, we are seeing primary care physicians stepping back from some of their uh, recommendations to the specialist and treating some of those conditions that they would have readily handed off for referral, treating them back in a primary care setting. Um, we're seeing people actually on while sitting in a doctor's office searching for alternatives to prescriptions, trying to understand site of care options when they've got specialty drugs that are being prescribed. Um, we see people sitting asking their physician, I'd like to go to this imaging facility instead of having this done in the neighboring hospital, is that okay? Right? We're seeing that dialogue happening over, the com over a mobile device in the doctor's setting. That's what's changing. Um, we present questions to the member to ask their doctor, to ask their primary care physician when going through a diagnosis, to ask their specialist when preparing for a, a particular procedure. So we're inviting the dialogue. We're inviting the doctor into the dialogue by trying to encourage him. So I, I think uh, this kind of leads a little bit into Rob's yeah. presentation. So in terms of how we're going to engage our members. So Go ahead, Rob. Let's do that. Let's move that. Let's move on. Oh, then. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and when it does move in, it's going to be a, kind of a discussion about accountable care. So let's keep that in mind. Um, we'll wait till we. Am I? Am I the clicker here? Okay. Uh, First of all, my name is Rob Honecker. I'm with Anthem Blue Cross. I always feel like I don't do that when I'm supposed to at board meetings, and today I probably didn't need to, so I thought I would do it. So <laughs> I'm one ahead next time I um, meet with you. I also see that um, this was supposed to be over at 12, but I'm sure you'll be, everybody will be happy to just go through lunch on this because this is very stimulating stuff. So no, I, I will go very quickly um, just to make up for time. And also because my watch keeps telling me I should have stood 15 minutes ago. Um, we want to discuss member engagement initiatives. Um, the primary focus is on, on the PPO plan. So when you're talking about this discussion, think of your basic PPO members. Um, page two, I just uh, the agenda. We want to go over engagement needs, you know, review some of the reasons why and also you know, you were in health beliefs, and I think some of these items will be good backdrop thoughts for you throughout of what, why do we need to engage members. 
We're going to talk about some current touch points in the Anthem environment where we're already touching your members, some with positive engagement, some just transactional. Um, and then we're going to look at programs that Anthem offers to engage members. And then to, uh, to your point, Mr. Lynn, we're also going to talk a little bit about engagements that we're doing with the providers because there's, you know, two sides to the equation. We're trying to influence some of their decisions. Um, so going to the first page, members becoming consumers, you know, it's, I wanted to take this slide out and I forgot. So I'm going to have a quick analogy, not as good as Leanna's about shopping for shoes, because by the way, I, I don't shop for shoes. I buy shoes, my wife returns them and gets me nice ones. Um, but I do think that we need to talk about members to consumers because it's a challenge. I think you've heard about all the discussions. and. I'm just going to give you the analogy that I try to think about when I go through these. If, if I were to go into my doctor and my knee wasn't working and she said go across the street to the hospital, I would go across the street to the hospital. I've had enough experiences with when I become a patient and my doctor tells me to do something, I just do it. Um, but I'm not a consumer at that point and we need to educate members so they become consumers easier because on the alternative if i went into my mechanic and he said your car is not working go across the street and get a new car um i'd at least check if it was a lamborghini dealer or not before i went and i would consider those things we don't in a healthcare environment and what you know, Patrick's trying to do and other people are trying to do is to educate you up front because those purchases we're making, that Lamborghini sounds awfully expensive. Your hospital care is that kind of a price and yet we're not making a decision. We're just walking across the street still. So, um, the next, some of the influences on needing the consumers to be involved and again, with our time, I'll just go over a few of those. Um, but these are kind of lists of things that are really challenging our marketplace right now. Um, they are cost drivers, um, they're coordination drivers. Um, but, and I was really pleased in health beliefs, several people different, several different of you t talked about engaging employees and helping their health and helping them get better. Um, behavioral costs are a dramatic implication. Um, I say over half. There are studies that will tell you it's even greater than that. I haven't seen a study that says it's less. And you can just take one example of um, behavioral and plug it at 34.9% of medic Americans are considered obese. Um, and that has such a trickle-down effect. It has a trickle-down effect on diabetes, on cardiac care on musculoskeletal. People don't think about the implications of that on your bones and everything. Um, just jumping to a few because I'm not going to talk about aging because for some reason they think that the numbers I'm looking at consider 60 aging and I don't like to consider that so we just pass it. Um, pharmacy. On average members in America take 12.2 prescriptions a year. I mean, we've got to think about that. Biologics, uh, hepatitis C, I don't need to talk to you about that. I mean, um, it's great that we can cure hepatitis C. It's an incredible, I mean, 12 weeks and you're cured. The only problem is that 12 weeks at $1,000 a day. And then I'll just touch on one more, inefficiencies. There's a ton of inefficiencies in our system. Um, there's a whole milieu of things we could discuss. I'll just throw out one national number that was reported last week. 55% of emergency room visits are unnecessary. The average cost of an emergency room visit is between $1,000 and $2,500. The average cost of a doctor's visit, that's a lot less significant, urgent care. So. Um, It took a sec. Not going to spend a lot of time on this, but one of the things we try to do, and actually CalPERS has been an incredible partner, is think of ways to get the consumer engaged in their health care without being punitive. Um, you know, when you look at access, 
Um, a, a great example of that is when CalPERS came to us and said, look at the difference on pain in a colonoscopy. And then your clinicians got involved and said, there's really no difference between an outpatient and an ambulatory surgical center unless there's other complicatings with the colonoscopy itself. Well, that got you to the right place. It was a simple plan design and it got them to the right place and you saved $4 million. Um, competitive pricing, if you look at the pricing disparity, just when you did your knee hip, your, your original study, you had a, you had, you were paying $110,000 in the Bay Area for a knee replacement and Stanford was able to do it for, at the time, $29,000. It was just, you know, we need to have, um, is, you know, address the disparity. Um, and then just, again, the rest of them multi-channels, you need to look at all your different tools, telemedicines, mobile tools. We've got to start engaging members. We've got a changing demographic. Um, you know, my son goes on and shows me on my iPhone how I can find a doctor, but he's there to let me use my phone, so that's good. Um, customer experience, we need easy to understand. And just when you go through this, even when you go through your health beliefs, We've got to make things that are easy for members to engage. Engagement's critical, but they want to, it's already tough to engage. You're already into a system that's taking you in different courses. Um, think about these as you think about ways to um, do it. I'm running into lunch, I know that. Just eat well, stay healthy, walk around, and I'll feel like I did my job. Uh, real quick, I'm going to tell you about some classic touch points, but this I think I can skip. I think it's just kind of startling. I, I haven't finalized my 2017 numbers, um, but online, for example, Castlight and a few of our other tools, your members touched us 777,000 times. Um, outreach, we have a wonderful program. Each quarter we send a letter out called My Health Advantage. It actually takes our data and tells an individual member some of the things we're seeing. You know, we're seeing you're at, um, you know, some of your conditions show you might be at risk. Hey, talk to your doctor about this. By the way, some of our claims are showing this is an issue. You might want to think about this exercise program. So we do that kind of outreach. We also do outreach through your disease management program where we focus on asthma, um, COBT, and, and other heart conditions and diabetes. Um, those kind of outreaches are occurring every day. Medical and provider care management, this is where we do utilization review with your doctors to make sure they're using the right level of care. We also do care management. And then claims and customer service. Almost all of this is claims, but it kind of gives you um, a perspective. I mean, we're, we're paying almost 7 million claims a year. Well, that tells you why we probably need engagement but it also tells you that we got a lot of data and we can go out in a lot of ways and use that. We've used it by helping to feed with Castlight. We're using it to help feed other solution sets. So, um, and also just as a personal sales pitch, that's about 10 million times we touch members and if you don't get a lot of complaints, think about that. We touch them 10 million times and if they're not complaining, then somebody else is back there that's doing their job. Anyway, that was a little sales pitch. Um, now here's to the point, and kind of to Ron's question too. Engaging members to manage their care better. We went through some of the reasons why we need to engage. We went some of, some of the thought process goes into it. I'm just gonna very quickly go through items that we're using to engage members. We're also getting very much more aggressive about engaging providers. We realize that so much of what happens, we read this, we see this, we're told this, we walk into our doctor, our doctor says, oh my gosh, you need to do this. We don't walk and say, wait a second, who owns that lab that you just sent me to? And wait, whose x-ray is this? When we're in a condition with a doctor, we move on. So we're trying to get doctors to more proactively manage the member's care. Um, looking at these items, Castlight, we've also talked about. Anthem Health Guide is really a derivative of the My 
um, health advantage letters that we're sending out. 24 seven nurse line, we all know you have available, but I'll be real um, frank with you, it is the most startlingly underutilized service I've ever seen in my history. Members don't use it, and they really should. Even if they're, they've are they got a scratchy throat, call, talk to a nurse, get some information, but they don't use it. We're trying to increase that. Um, reference pricing, I don't need to go into that with your colonoscopies and your arthroscopies, you need hip, you really, we're the leader in that. CalPERS initiated the most significant programs in the industry well before others. Uh, disease management you know about. Live Health Online, you know, we're finding easy access to that primary care opportunity that you get on Live Health Online is very effective in especially that first check. Do I need to go to an emergency room? Um, no, you've got a sinus infection. You need to go to the pharmacy, et cetera. Wellby, um, actually Patrick talked a little bit about it, um, so I won't get into that. Um, diabetes prevention program. We've just kicked this off, this previous year with you, actually motivated by Kathy and Dr. Sun and everybody. Numbers are starting to click up, but it's real simple. Diabetes can be stopped, type two diabetes can be stopped almost or primarily through just exercise and weight loss. And the numbers are starting to grow. This is a wonderful program where we pay for everything to just get you out to walk, to get you to eat. And I hope at some point, we've got some testimonies from the members that have done it. It's just, if they do it, it's fascinating. So anyway, Quick Care, you just initiated this year. It's a program where Anthem's going to identify people that use the ER, and we're gonna go out and tell them in their EOB, hey, use better care. We're going to send them a, a, the ability to get their application to search for urgent care. And then we're also gonna do a voicemail caller thing, but you know, people don't really listen, but it'll be the automated voice going, you, you may have seen care that could have been better. Um, a couple programs that you we're talking to your people about, um, to a certain extent, not all of them, but just so you know, other things Anthem's done. Um, Anthem Engage is part of the evolution that we're working with um, Castlight on and getting people much more integrated into um, health and wellness. Member shopper programs, there's actually been some pilots throughout the um, country that are still being analyzed where they say, look, if you find a place that, for an example, if you're going for an MRI and you do an MRI that's $2,000 less, we'll give you 100 bucks. We save 2000 um, there, there's some interesting studies. We've got to wait to see it because it seems like the person that was going to go to the cheapest one also goes in and suddenly shops, you know, and they get their money for free. Uh, Consumer-driven health, people mentioned, typically very high deductible plans coupled with HRAs or HSAs. Uh, spine zone, we've already started discussions with Dr. Sun on and Kathy on that. It's a program that says you don't need surgery, you need to get up, you need to walk, you need to exercise, you need to stop going for your spine until you've done all these things. EAP you're familiar with, uh, biometric screening, and then specialty products. These are all engagement tools that if they're integrated, they help. Um, Again, very briefly, we're trying to engage providers more because, okay, uh, we have a Vividi, we actually collaborated, narrow networks, we're getting down to episodic treatment groups where they, um, they treat better. Accountable care, we actually have doctors referring to better care. Cancer quality care programs, we're rewarding doctors. We're actually paying them more to follow the pathway, do what's right, we'll give you extra money so you just manage it right. We do reviews, um, we're gonna do cardiac reviews, value-based insurance design we're exploring, and then longitudinal patient records is kind of an evolutionary process of getting one member's complete LPR under one system. We're uh, collaborating with Epic, one of the largest provider sides of the world to actually create this one patient record that no matter who you see, you have it, you can go out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. I know you had to speed 11 through that. 11 minutes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no, it, 
but I think there, I think there will, I think there is more interest in sort of joint decision making and both uh, provider and member engagement. So maybe we can th think about how we follow up on this this conversation because I'm not sure we got all the way where um, where everyone wanted to be today. Well, and, and I would just, a lot of the things that we uh, work on, we constantly explore with Cal CalPERS and your staff, and your clinical team and your leadership. Some they're interested in, some they're not. So you can also uh, check with Leanna if you want us to come back and talk about anything. Okay. Um, and Sounds not, good. not make me keep everybody from lunch. <laughs> Sorry for forcing that, um, <laughs> that speed session there. Are there any burning questions from board members at this time? Okay. Well, that uh, concludes our morning session on healthcare. We're a little bit late, sorry about that. Um, it's now time to take our lunch break. I really thank you so much to the panelists for being with us and uh, sharing so much important information. And we're gonna come back. We're scheduled for one o'clock, but maybe we'll start at 1.15 and um, we'll see you all then.